Could you imagine if your child comes up to you and says, I want to quit school, drop everything, and chase my dreams of becoming successful in the music industry? Uh, your first response might be to grab them by the shoulders and shake them wildly and say, don't do it, you'll never make it. But the sympathetic, emotional side of you might kick in and then say, you know what, chase your dreams, go for your goals. And then the logic side of you will propose, why don't you just finish school, get into college, and then get yourself a nice, well-paid, safe job, do your music stuff on the side. Which is a fair enough thing to say if you don't actually understand the inner workings of a creative mind. Because see, for us, expressing creatively becomes as vital a function as breathing. We inhale inspiration and we exhale our art form into existence. So we don't really have a choice, we have to make a career out of it. And this is where things start to go a little bit wrong because the music industry in particular, of which I'm a casualty, is so full of problems. But then I became a tech entrepreneur. And entrepreneurs love nothing better than a big problem to solve. And here's what I am aiming to work towards, and it's this problem, that the music industry was never really designed by musicians. It was designed by businessmen. And that's not to say that businessmen don't appreciate and value music. They just don't understand the conditions under which creativity can really flourish. But that's really been a societal thing, and we are getting through that. We've, we've come up with some great innovations over the last 15 years with the way that we create, distribute, and consume music. But that hasn't really translated into better conditions for a lot of musicians. So I'll give you an example. Recently, I came across a video called The Truth About Money in Music, and in it, James from the band Violent Sohos talks about some of their accomplishments. They had the major record deal. They were playing the big international festivals. They, all, they also had a song that was 21 on the US charts. And on the day that they were nominated for an ARIA award, James was applying for a job at McDonald's. <laughs> the reality is there is very little money in the music industry anymore, particularly with recorded music sales. But there is good money in events and touring. But this dependence on our day jobs now means that it utterly compromises our ability to produce new creative material, to rehearse, to perform. And throw in the mix relationship issues, financial issues, and then all this can really increase the problems we have with anxiety, depression, substance abuse, an increased risk of suicide. So what is going to be the thing that changes this narrative for the creative industry. And as crazy as it sounds, I believe that it's actually time travel. So is it possible? Scientists say yes, but that the technology, we are not advanced enough to make that happen in our lifetime just yet. And it's dangerous. If you were to go back into the past, and tamper with it at all, you might accidentally prevent yourself from ever having it existed. So if a time travel industry was to materialize, we would have to solve that problem. And there is a way that I believe that we could do that. Why is it that when we think about time travel, we are thinking about something that can send our whole bodies to another point in time? Why couldn't we just send some of our senses to experience another point in time, say our vision and our hearing. Wouldn't that be a compelling form of time travel? So I'll ask you just to imagine closing your eyes for the minute, don't do it, but just imagine, and then you open them somewhere else in a different time. Imagine that you're at the Martin Luther King speech and you're surrounded by African-Americans hearing this historic moment for the first time. You look down, but you can't see your body. And you're looking around at all the action and people are seeing through you. They don't know that you're there. But you are experiencing that as if you are, physiologically. So if we were to argue that an experience like that, an observational, experiential form of time travel, 
is a legitimate form of time travel, how many people would agree that that's fairly fair? How many would pay for an experience like that? <laughs> this is what a time travel time machine would look like that would allow you to travel back into the past. That camera, <laughs> like the name suggests, captures video in all directions. And that thing on the side is a virtual reality headset that takes your point of view to the center of where that camera is. And it is experiencing this content through virtual reality that gives you this incredible sense of physically being in that reality. And it's called presence, something that you can only get through a virtual reality device. But there's a catch. Time travel theory suggests that you can only go back in time as far as to when the first time machine was ever invented. That is true with, even with this example. So how is this technology going to save the music industry? After all, it exists in our present. This is the furthest back that we're going to be able to travel. So this is a long-term commitment. So in order to really appreciate it, we need to use an example from our past, a hypothetical one. Imagine in 1969 if this technology was available and Woodstock had populated their entire event with 360-degree cameras and they'd captured hundreds of hours of content. Right now, in 2015, you could pull out your mobile phone, download the Woodstock virtual reality experience, put it inside a small, cheap, under $100 head-mounted display, put it to your face, and then things are dark for a moment, but then all of a sudden, you're standing on the main stage and you're overlooking half a million people. And then off to the side, you can hear the first act open up the festival. And they are so close that you would be able to touch them if it was not for your body not really being there. <laughs> Click a button and now you're on the floor. You're in amongst the sea of people and you're looking back up at the stage that you just were at. You absorb that experience for a little bit, click a button, and now you're backstage. You're overhearing the panicked conversations as drama and chaos unfolds. And if anybody knows the Woodstock story, you will know that everything that could go wrong at an event went wrong at that event. So thinking about how long they have been around for, they could have been commercializing and selling access to their content for the last 46 years and indefinitely into the future. And like a fine wine, anything that is preserved in time gains value the older it is. So this is potentially billions of transactions that could have been occurring for Woodstock over its lifetime. And every artist that performed at that event could have been getting royalties the whole time. Do you know what they actually got instead? $1.4 million worth of debt that took them a decade to pay off. Now you can see the value of how capturing moments in time and monetizing this nostalgia can save the music industry. What if, in 1969, they decided to capture every event, every concert and every festival, and you could access every single one of them from your mobile device through virtual reality? and experience them as if you were there. This is a project that we started three days ago with a friend, Brandon Rosado, from the United States, who does a lot of modeling for us. As we were talking about the concept for this, we were like, why don't we just model Woodstock? And so we came up with this project of modeling the festival in every detail, and we want to engage people who actually went there and collect their stories. This isn't an official thing yet, but we are going to uh, try and make it such and collect all the content that was produced as a result of this and every story and see if we can digitize people's memories and create this living time capsule, which will be a valuable record for humanity. And what I loved about going through that process was the fact that a few days ago, that project didn't exist. And all of a sudden, it does. When Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech, they didn't really have the capabilities to deliver on their dreams, so they remained dreams. But today, 
anything that we can think of, anything that we can imagine, we can create. But we don't call achievable dreams, dreams. You wouldn't go to the dragon's den and say, I want you to invest in my dream. You say vision, because achievable dreams, that's what we call vision. And I want to ask you, what dream have you converted into a vision, and are you embodying the actions that are going to allow you to achieve it? Thank you.